Thank you, Paul, and uh, thank you everyone for having me back. I've, I think I've almost lost track of how many years it's been. I think it's about five or six years that I've been here, and I always look forward to this night because it reminds me about how little I actually know. Uh, I realize how, how, how smart engineers are and how, much I, how little I understand about the world around me and how it works, and which is why I always look forward to, to this evening. For the most part, uh, most of the 3D images I get to see are Rob Ford in front of his office, and I'm not sure if they've built a big enough scanner for that just yet. But uh, you know, the, the topic of 3D imaging, I think, is a fantastic and a very timely one. I just did a story uh, about a month ago, actually, at the Toronto Reference Library downtown, and I'm not sure if you're aware, but they actually have a 3D printer in the Reference Library now that is free for anyone in the public to come down and use, and so I had a chance to see it up close and personal. It's just amazing when you think about how far the technology has come over the years, and I'm sure our presenters are going to tell us how close we are now to the replicators of Star Trek fame, and that we're only a few, a few years away from that. So without further ado, uh, just to give you a sense of the program uh, for tonight, we have uh, three wonderful speakers who are going to take us through various aspects of 3D imaging, and then towards the end we'll have a question and answer session, and as you can probably see, just about midway down on the stairs there, there are some microphones that will be set up. So we'll take a few questions and answers depending on how much time we have and we'll do our best to get as many questions and comments as, as we can. So first uh, I want to introduce our uh, first speaker and that's Peter Schreier who's the Advanced Technology Manager at the MMM Group and he's going to be talking about 3D laser scanning for industrial buildings and this is a, another aspect of 3D technology that's come a long way so I'll let him tell you all about that. So please welcome Peter Schreier. Good evening, everybody. Um, it's always hard to go after somebody like Stephen, who professionally speaks, and then have me come up here, who's an engineer, and who has very little, I know, <laughs> tough time going after him. But uh, what I'm going to do in my speech here, we at MMM have a, uh, a technologies group that we do a lot of research and development into these new technologies. And one of the things we've come up with the last few years is idea that innovation is part of our business. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. My apologies. And as part of our business, we decided to go ahead and give a shot to some of these technologies. I've been working in, I guess, the 3D imaging area for about 10 or 12 years now. It's come a long way since then. Right here, what we have is a composite picture of what a 3D image is. Now you notice, for those of you in the industry, that this is a fairly, fairly old type of instrument here. It's about, oh, five years old. And in this industry, that is getting obsolete. You know, what we do work in is various industries. My part of this uh, idea here is for industrial purposes, buildings, roads, dams, however you want to call it. In that case, we're looking at areas that are, you know, 20 meters to about 2,000 meters distance. The reason we have, uh, we use these laser scanners, especially in the engineering field and industrial purposes, is it has several major advantages over conventional surveying. Um, I know some of you must have known what surveying is all about and using GPS, total stations and the like. The advantage of these laser scanners of various forms is that in addition to the same abilities as the uh, total stations and GPS systems, we can traverse with them, we can resect with them. They also have an ability to be the same control system that your ground control is in. If your ground is in UTMs, we can do that, no problem. So it allows us to do kind of a, a merging of both survey data and laser scan data. We'll get a very high density data set. Some of these scanners will run about a million points a second. You know, we don't usually use that kind of density unless we really require it but it's available. And one thing I'm going to come back to many times during this presentation is the fact of safety. In this case here, these laser scanners, as far as I'm concerned, are the best thing that we've come up with in the surveying field. Their safety. I do not have to put people in the field in danger. And I'll show you a few examples of what I mean by that. What you see here is a picture of a power station that we did. 
Now this is a lot of scans and a lot of data coming through, but you'll see what I mean by you know, a very high level of detail possible. We can pick up the conductors, we can pick up the wires. And in no case here was the substation had to shut down. We ran it just as normal. Right? What we get here is what's called a full 3D virtual reality. What I mean by third virtual reality system is here is that all the scans, in that case there, there were about a dozen of them, are put together using a least squares adjustment. Now, again, those of you who are in the surveying field or civil engineering field may understand what least squares adjustment is. Normally you're only doing it for, you know, 100, 200 points. Imagine doing it for about a billion. You understand the computer power that we have to use to actually get these things to work. What we've done here is we have what's called one with the laser intensity values. That is the raw data that we get from a laser. You know, we color it based on red being lowest intensity, green being the best intensity fire back at us. On most of these laser scanners, what you'll find is that there's also a camera into, on top of these things, and it takes the digital picture that's overlaid right on top of the camera. So what you see in the bottom came from the laser scanner itself. No, oh, I'm sorry. There we go. Is that okay? Everybody hear me? We good? Okay, fantastic. Now what you find is some of the, uh, the laser scanners here. When we get a request to do a laser scan of something, one of the first things I'm going to ask you is, what is it for? What do you need to do? There are areas where I'm going to tell you that's a stupid idea to do this. If you're looking at a big flat area, there's very little sense in us doing it with a laser scanner. In this case here, what we did is we did a high density scan of a, a substation here. What they were looking for was a very high level, excuse me, high level of detail where the wires were, condition of the conductors, condition of, the, uh, of all the bolts and everything else. And what you'll find there on the right hand side are actual scans of the bolts. We were getting accuracy of about, and resolution, sorry, of about two millimeters. Okay. Realistically, that's the limit of what we're doing in this kind of case. You'll find the, uh, when they go into the other speakers here, they go at much higher resolution using different technologies. Okay. And this is kind of some of the ideas that we get out of it. The top there is the actual laser scan of it. The bottom there is when you bring it into AutoCAD. Sorry? <laughs> Me and this thing are not getting along. What you'll find there, there we go. Stay close to it, all right. I'm not, I'm not a journalist here, so you know, that's the problem. <laughs> oh, that works. <laughs> the bottom there is what we get as a result. This is what you'll deliver to the clients. This is exact. Every piece of that drawing there has a coordinate. The 3D, we have three-dimensional models of the entire stop station. And what we use it for is if we want to see, can we put another line through here? Can we put haul trucks through here? Can we run, you know, a new pipeline, new power lines? Again, this is much, very much a safety feature. We'll tell you your clearance is, in some cases there, 12.59 meters. So it means a 13 meter high truck is not going through there. We do what's called, what I call very complex projects here. And this actually will go back to a safety aspect as well. In this case here, we did a tunnel, a uh, 10 meter diameter tunnel uh, for a municipality. It had a piece of it had collapsed, um, reasoning unknown. Now there's no way I'm gonna be able to send a surveyor or survey team out there to take a look at it. Nobody's gonna go out there to say, take pictures of a collapsed part of a tunnel. Can't say I blame them. With this thing here, we can stand off about 150 meters and scan it. Every pixel and every point that we scan has a resolution, in this case, of about five millimeters. So we can actually take a very dense look at it, model it, and see why it collapsed without having to put anybody anywhere near it, the collapsed piece. When you're looking at small-scale small, small scale complex projects. This is where um, what's called BIM modeling comes into play. In this case here, these pipes are two, four, eight inches diameter pipes, standard water, gas lines, things like that. And what we're able to do is model every single pipe, every single you know, conduit that we have there, and take a look and see where do we bottleneck this? 
What are the problems with it? Can we put some pipes in here? Can we change this out? In most cases, laser scanning is used as a planning tool because we cannot take an actual survey out there and see every single piece. We use this. You, know, you can take a picture of this, no problem, and see, but you will not have the spatial qualities of it. The spatial pictures here, in this case, will show you exactly how far each of these are from each other. I'm going to give you some examples of projects that uh, the MMM group has done. Um, they range from very small-scale housing, you know, heritage buildings, things like that, to very large substations, uh, refineries, various things like that, including airports. And you can see the range of what we can do with this thing. This here, uh, I see forgot to mention, I'm from the city of Calgary. My home office is there, but I travel to Toronto pretty much on a constant basis because our head office is here. But one thing we did in Calgary is a 58-story building that went up last year. It's called the Bow Building, where a couple of the major oil companies have their new headquarters. And what we did is we scanned the building for them. The reason we scanned it for them is they wanted to see what's behind the walls after we board it up. So what you can see here is we did a scan, and this is not the actual point cloud or whatever you want to call it. This is something that came out of AutoCAD eventually that shows us, okay, there's pipe conduits here, there's electrical conduits here, there's obstructions here. So if you're going to bring it back out later on and say, I need to fix X, Y, Z, they're going to say, okay, well, you can take that off, but don't drill here. So it gives you an idea exactly what's behind the wall after it's been done. This was something we just completed very recently. It's a 50-meter building, and what the concern was, uh, it's here in Ontario someplace, that when the building was finished, it encroached on the property line. Now, you're never going to be able to send a surveyor up to all, 50, all five or eight stories there and take an actual position of each of those overhangs. So what we did is we scanned the front facet of the building, tied into the survey control. The survey control is tied into the property line there, which is that big blue vertical line. And we could tell, you know, tell the client, tell the municipality, yes, your building does encroach on the city street. What happens from that point? Well, not my problem. <laughs> We just give you the data. We're not concerned with what you do with it. <laughs> yeah. you, know, you know, when you ask me about accuracy of this thing, in this case here, we did a fairly high density scan of it. So we were looking at about six millimeters, I think we ended up being. So it's fairly accurate. When I tell you your building overhangs by three centimeters, good chance it does. Now, this was an interesting project. This was a demonstration project of the expansion of the Edmonton International Airport. Realistically, it was more for marketing purposes and not, not for our marketing purposes, for the Edmonton International Airport's marketing. They wanted to show the new airport. This is a view from the air side part of it. Now, in most cases, they're never going to allow anybody onto the air side portion of a terminal. You know, security risks, everything else. So what we're allowed to do then is they allowed us to go in there and they said, okay, you have three hours to do this. We managed to get 21 scans of the entire airside terminal at that point in time. Okay? That's how fast it goes. A normal scan is about, well, it does a full 360 dome. It captures everything except the little piece below itself, which you can't see. It does that in about 15 minutes. So in this case here, they were very happy with us because we can get in and out without disrupting air terminal operations. And this, these are actual scanned images of it. And then they said, well, if you can do the outside, can you do the inside? Certainly. These are not enhanced images. These are the color photos overlaid on top of the scanned images. It looks like a color photograph, except the advantage of this is every single pixel you see there has an actual valid coordinate. So what they can do is they use a lot of this to, I guess, design traffic flow not of vehicle traffic flow, but human traffic flow. How do we get people in and out of these areas quickly when a large number of aircraft come in? Okay, that's another example of what happened there. This is a very interesting project. This is the uh, Gage House in Hamilton. It's a historical house. Uh, you probably, guys probably know more about this than I do, the actual history behind it. But we were asked to come in and do a scan of it. What you see there is actually not the highest resolution scanner we have. At this point in time, it wasn't available. 
But they asked us, take a look at this, scan it for us, do a historical record of this. What you get here? I said, okay, that's no problem. And these scanners that we have, you have the option to say, I want this piece to be high resolution scan, this piece here, not so much. Because the number of points you're getting can overwhelm most computers. So what we normally do is we do an overall relatively low level scan. By low level, I mean a point every two or three centimeters. That's what it's come down to. And then what we do is we went inside and say, okay, well, we need to take a look at some of the damage that's occurring just due to historical reasons. We are actually able to pick up everything from the plaster cracking, the bolts that they were using on the doors, door frames, everything else like that. And it gives you a, a historical record of what this looked like at that point in time. Now, when I say we use historical records, we use this not on just historical sites, but on any other building that they want to take a look at before they do construction around it. Um, consider a fact that if you're an owner of a fairly large building and they do start doing construction next to you, you want a record of what it looked like before and after in case of damage. And this is what happens after. There's a fairly automated process at that point to get it into CAD drawings. You notice there's terms called point cloud. A point cloud is a very large data set of millions to billions of points that come from the scanner. And from that, you basically create the models that you see there and the CAD drawings. And for those of you who are familiar with AutoCAD Revit, a lot of this goes right into that. This is kind of level of detail we're looking at. At the Rogers Center, we were picking up the little gargoyles you see on there. Again, this was done for pre-construction purposes. There was construction going around on the area there, and they wanted to make sure that before the construction started, they had an accurate picture of what it looked like. We went back in there after was, construction was done, see what it looks like then. In this case here, there wasn't really any damage, but it's a good historical record. Things like streetscapes. This really has, to be honest, little engineering value, but it's a really interesting way of looking at a neighborhood. A lot of real estate agents are doing this nowadays. Um, using a high-end scanner is a little odd, but you know, if they're willing to pay for it, that's fine. This is, was a very interesting one. This is the roller coaster at Toronto's Wonderland. They were looking at uh, expanding it, adding some more rails, adding some more features to it. The problem is, in order to do that, the inside of the building is completely dark. One of the advantages of a laser scanner, it doesn't care. It runs perfectly fine in absolute darkness. What you won't get is a picture, obviously, because if you can't see it, it's not going to see the picture. But it's an 800 nanometer laser, so it has no problem running in complete darkness. And this allows them to create a model of what's inside the building, how close they are to other rails, how close they are to other features and obstructions, and then design what they need to do from there. Okay? Like I said, in this case here, it's also a safety factor because you're not going to have people crawling up and around things. We were able to do this while the system was running. Okay, so we do not hinder production. Okay, this is a bridge that was done. It's a swing bridge. Uh, actually very done very recently. They were looking at, there were some, I believe some damage done to it just due to erosion, weather, age. And because, again, the safety issue, you cannot send people out there underneath it to do scans or surveys of it. We stand off about 150 meters, scan the whole thing, in and out of there in a matter of, I think, two hours. Okay. No disruption to traffic, no disruption to productivity. Now, a lot of the work we've done so far has been with power stations, substations. Again, safety feature. We do not have to shut the plant down. We can actually sit outside the gates if they want us to do that. We don't like that. And just do a scan. We're going to end out of there in a matter of hours. No hindrance on productivity. And what you'll see there is we have managed to get a lot of the power lines. You know, a lot of people ask me, say, oh, how did you manage to get that? The power line is probably about a centimeter diameter. True. Our resolution is probably only two centimeters, but we get enough reflectance off each line that we can just model it through. Allows us to do clearance structures, see what they're made of, see what they're designed with. 
And again, I'm just going to walk through a few of these here. You can see the level of detail that we're getting off this and how big this is. In this case here, it is about 300 meters by about 400 meters. This was done in a day to scan. Now, when I tell you it's done in a day, that's the fuel portion. I'll tell you what it means to actually process this later on. It's a little different story. This is a picture of what it actually looks like and the scanned image. Yeah. And this is what it looks like. One hour to put control on the ground. That's actually an optional thing we don't actually have to do unless you really need it. Three hours to scan, uh, and that's only because my surveyor was probably a little slow. It was too hot for him, I think, that day. Three hours to scan, four hours to process this. Okay? That is the big difference between doing this this way and doing it via conventional survey. The advantage is, of course, I don't disturb anything. It's very safe. And in this case here, I end up with close to 10 million points. So the advantage of this as well is that in this case here, they said, well, we don't really need all the level of details. We just need where the poles are, uh, where some of the conductors are, the guy wires, et cetera, et cetera. We figured this was a good way to scan anyway, just for safety purposes. So we went ahead and did that. Uh, two weeks after we had done this, they came back to us, you know what, we need you to go pick up some of the other things as well. The fence line, the, uh, some of the other poles, some of the other conductors, some of the resistors in there. We didn't have to go back in there and do it again. We already had the data. I guarantee you we charged them for it. Because <laughs> I hate change orders. <laughs> But that's, that really is a big advantage of it. You can go in there, get everything. You know, your client may only want this piece, but the problem of only wanting to scan this piece is a matter of a few minutes. You know, might as well get everything you can. And this is what actually results from it. The piece on the left there is just a small portion of it. I just kind of didn't want to have to put it on my PowerPoint, but shows an extreme level of detail. You are getting the bolts on this thing. One on the right is actually a 3D PDF. So you can send this to your client, show them this exactly what it looks like. We were able to actually model the size of the angle iron, the size of the bolts, and show you, oh, you have missing bolts here, here, and here. Okay. Look at it as a maintenance problem. And the final one I want to look at is one that took us a very long time to do. The level of complexity of these things is extreme. This is a refinery. I'm not allowed to say where it is because the client hasn't given us permission to do it, but they said it's okay to show it. This took approximately two weeks to scan. Just a level of detail. And the reason it takes so long is we have to set up in a lot of places to get every bit, piece, and angle that we can. The advantage of a scanner is it sees everything you do. Problem is that's also a disadvantage. It doesn't see into shadowed areas. You know, if something obs obscuring it, well, you're going to have to go around and see it. Okay? Um, one thing I forgot to mention before is that uh, terrestrial scanning is not very useful to create an elevation model because it does not go through grass. It does not go through the canopy very well. So if that's what you're looking for, you're looking at LIDAR, not a razor scanner. Okay? But this is a level of detail. Two weeks to scan, almost a month to process. Okay? The level of detail is incredibly huge. But the client loved this. You can walk in there, and you can see where every pipe is. You can label, this is a gas line, this is your water line, this is your steam line. You can also say, you know what, I need to de-bottleneck this. Where am I going to put a new pipeline? Where can I fit? Okay. This gives you exact level of detail on that. It is a horrendous cost, I'll be honest with you. The processing of these takes a long time. But the advantage is, you have a complete model of it. There we go. Now, what do we get out of this uh, whole schmozzle of point clouds? Again, you'll have millions upon millions of points. How useful is that to you? Well, it depends. In a lot of cases, the client will say, I just want the points, and they will do the processing themselves. That's fine. There are various, you know, AutoCAD, MicroStation, various GIS packages will bring those point clouds in, and you can do it yourself. And you can take off, you know, create your own three-dimensional models, you can take slices against it. We found a lot of value in using this in a smart plant system
through clash detection. You can add in, you have your CAD model of what's above ground. You can bring in as built from below ground, utility like locates, everything like that. It's all brought into the same model. This is an example, this is what's called image mapping. That little piece you see on the left hand side is a blown up image of what you see on the right. This was done with a laser scanner with a range of about 1,600 meters. This is a little different than what the normal ones we use, but this was done as a matter of kind of safety. There were some issues with rock faces falling. They wanted to bring us out. But you can see the level of details. You can see the cracking in the walls. I have a fly through of this. Unfortunately, it's too large to put on a computer. It's a, just a little over one gigabyte of a fly through. But that gives you a level of detail. You'll see about, about a two kilometer long wall here where you can see the level of detail on what's going on here. Missing a piece here. Ah, there we go. Sorry. That one. My fault. Again, what we do with a lot of these, a lot of these imagery here is we give the client the point cloud if they want it, or we do the processing for you. What we've done in a, some of these cases where there's a lot of data, uh, particularly that refinery, because we've offshore it as well. There are places around the world, in Canada as well, in North America, that specialize in processing this kind of data. You know, generally, most engineering shops do not want to spend a huge amount of data or, or money on these kind of processes. So we tend to offshore them as well, if you want a lot of detail. In this one here, you'll see the inside of the building. Okay? This level of detail you'll see on these things. And this is something that's become very popular with the, with the architecture groups. You basically get a BIM model, building information model, for those of you who are not familiar with it. You will get a, basically a three-dimensional model you can put on your own computer, put as a 3D PDF if you like, and it will show you exactly where every pipe is, where the floors are, where the whatever else is behind the walls. That's become very, very valuable. Okay. Again, the modeling that we do with it. The level of detail you get is amazing. It's very valuable for planning purposes, very valuable for historical records, and very valuable for maintenance. And reason, there's several, I guess, deciding factors on whether you want to use conventional survey methods or whether you want to use a scanner. First and foremost, it has to be fairly complex. Sorry. If you're just doing a flat area or flat surface, you know what, it's going to cost you a lot less to do conventionally. And I'll tell you that straight out if you ask me. If you're looking for hard to reach areas, exactly what you just want to use. If you're looking for a fast turnaround, if you have to be in and out of there. I don't mean fast turnaround as in getting the data, because that may take longer depending on how complex it is. But if you need your field crews in and out of there in a matter of hours, this will work for you. Okay. And again, like I said, the scanner doesn't care if it's dark. We've done areas of airports, like runways, where, yes, it's a flat surface, but the fact of the matter is we can get in and out of there in a matter of hours, so they don't have to shut the runway down for too long. Okay? And this really is the level of detail we're getting out of a lot of things. What I found is that in the last few years that I've been doing this, it's been very hard to predict where things are going in the next short term. We always tend to be very conservative about, yeah, I think we can do that, or I think the computer process is going to come up and match what we're doing. Right now, our biggest problem is, is computer horsepower. That really hasn't caught up to us anymore. Back when uh, laser scanning was first done, was back in 1960 or so. That's really the length of time it's been going on. But at that point in time, it was done mainly for government agencies, military, and things like that. It wasn't until the, I guess, early 90s, when a company called Sierra Technologies made a version for engineering purposes. This company was bought up by Leica, and I'm sure a few of you know who Leica is. They produce laser scanners now and have been doing that for quite a while. But it's only recently that we've had the computer power to be able to process this and see what's going on with it. Maybe the next 10 years, we'll see what we can do with it. Maybe have a full 3D model in a matter of hours. But right now, one hour of processing is about one hour in the field. Okay. And 
And I think we'll have questions after the presentations, but I thank you for your attention, and I hope you learned something. Thank you.